Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. It's excellent to have you here as always and thank you for watching. Today we're talking about casings. Specifically, can you reuse a casing that looks like this? And why is the answer yes? This whole idea came up because I saw some posts from some people that were having a hard time finding the ammunition components. And I said, well, hey, you know, I've got a whole lot of casings on my range that I am never going to use. I don't reload and I have never cleaned it up. So I'm like, hey, you know what? Every time I go out there, I'll pick up a couple batches worth of casings and I'll throw them up on the website. Well, then the internet happened. First and foremost, this is not a steel case. This is not an aluminum case. This is an oxidized brass case. I know that there are some people out there that have never seen something like this before, but indeed brass does oxidize and it looks like this when it does. Just because you don't have the experience doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. Many would call this a corroded case, and I don't think that terminology is correct. I would call this an oxidized case. Now, corrosion can be caused by oxidation. A lot of times it's caused by other things, but oxidation is something that happens to basically all metals. Now, for anybody who hasn't been following the channel for a long period of time, I think I've mentioned this multiple times, but my classical education was in chemistry. Uh, I was a chemist for five years out of university, and then I found out that, or figured out through trial and error, that the chemistry profession is basically full of a bunch of feckless weirdos, and I needed to make an exit really quick because I definitely did not fit in. I'm a proponent of the chemistry profession returning to its roots, going back to weapons manufacture and alchemy, where it should be, not chasing some made-up science. Digression, my bad boys and girls, but to review, oxidation versus corrosion. And usually where these two terms, at least in my experience with most people, end up getting mixed up is where they intersect, which is, again, in most people's experience, in iron-containing compounds, so rust. So your rust is going to be your ferric oxide, and that chemical formula is going to be Fe2O3, but it's going to be usually an iron-3 oxidation state, and that's going to be your red-colored rust. Now... We use oxides of irons for protective purposes as well. Uh, this gun is blued. That bluing is a chemical process by which we convert the iron contained in this receiver into rust. It's just a different chemical structure of rust. I believe that that's going to be Fe3O4, but if I'm mistaken, then I'll edit that out. Different oxidation state. And the difference there really is the way the crystalline structure organizes itself between the two su substrates. So if you think of an iron rust ferric oxide, usually it's some kind of flaky, clumpy, something like that. It's a dusty substance that doesn't adhere directly to the metal. Usually it can be wiped off relatively easily just with some abrasion. I can rub my hand on this thing all day long and it is not going to come off black. Well, I mean, maybe on this gun because it's really dirty. The magnetite contained in this finish is not going to come off on my hands in an appreciable quantity that it, I would call my hand rusty, for instance. The reason rust is corrosive is because it pulls itself away from the surface. It doesn't adhere to the surface tightly like the magnetite bluing does and therefore it does not halt the oxidation of the substrate by being there. So what is this? Well, there might be some small denominations of things in there, but by and large, this is copper and zinc. I know that you guys are gonna be shocked by this, but copper and zinc can both oxidize under standard conditions. <laughs> now, I have a single chemical reaction to show you guys in today's video that will bring this all into focus. But before we do, we do have to pay the bills. And for that, I thought since we're talking about education in this one, I have a sponsor for today that is infinitely more practical than a bachelor's of science degree in chemistry. And that is Sonoran Desert Institute. Have you ever considered a career in the firearms industry? or wanted to learn more about a particular discipline as it relates to guns. Perhaps you're under intense pressure from your family to go to college, but you realize that's a really bad investment because the only things that you're good at are guns and basket weaving. If any of that is you, then a course of study at SDI might be right up your alley. What did you major in in school? Guns. 
Sonoran Desert Institute is a DEAC accredited online college focusing on programs and courses pertinent to firearms. So if you're into gun repair, ballistics, or learning about firearms, SDI might be something you want to look into. They even have funding plans and payment options available for anybody who doesn't have a pile of money laying around, like most of us. So if you're interested, you can catch up with them at sdi.edu. Special thanks to SDI for making today's video possible. And on to the chemistry. So it's been some time since this old dog has chemistry, but I can still do a thing or two. At least sort of anyway. <laughs> what is this thing and what's going on here? Why is it brown? So again, throwing out any small denominations of things that are going to be so small in percentage that we're not going to be able to visually identify them anyway. Zinc. Can't be zinc because zinc oxide basically forms one species in nature and it's a white powder. This is not white. I don't care how colorblind you are. That is not white in any persuasion. So it's got to be a copper derivation. Well, there's really two copper oxides that form naturally in nature. There are some other ones, but they, they're very, very rare, and they can only be generated under laboratory conditions, really. Anyway, we have cupric and cuprous oxides. Cuprous oxide is going to be usually a red solid of some kind, depending on, again, the particle size. It's either going to be yellow or red, and most formations is going to be red in color. And then you've got cupric oxide, which is going to be black in color. This looks pretty close. So in preparation for today's experiment, I took about 25 of these casings that look like this and went ahead and washed them up with some distilled water, make sure that there's no particular or anything like that in there. You know, there's a gravel range top, mud, you know, all that sort of stuff. We don't want any of that stuff in there. And then we're going to react with hydrochloric acid for two reasons. Uh, one, if you use nitric acid, then you're going to go on a watch list for explosives manufacturer. And not that it would matter. I'm on so many watch lists at this point in time that what's another one? HCl is going to be selective. Copper will react with both nitric and sulfuric acid. Hydrochloric acid will not react with copper. It will, however, react with both the zinc metal and if we've got any cupric oxide, it will react with that as well. So we should see, if this is cupric oxide on the outside, we should see basically copper metal left on the surface. Depending on how aerated the water is that we use, we may also see some formation of that cuprous, that red oxide that we talked about earlier, depending on how oxygen rich it is. So what you guys are seeing here is a time lapse of the addition of the hydrochloric acid. Now, you'll notice that you do see some bubbles forming here, and that is the reaction of zinc with the hydrochloric acid and basically that forms zinc chloride and hydrogen gas but you can also see bye bye to that black color with a little bit of that red formation that i sort of kind of predicted basically what we're left with after that is a relatively clear solution that has got a little bit of a green tinge to it now that's going to be the copper chloride that has been absorbed by the solution and i don't know this is a really dumb idea I tried to precipitate it out for you guys by adding some calcium carbonate. Now, the correct compound to use would have been sodium hydroxide, but I lost my sodium hydroxide. I couldn't find it anywhere. And it did precipitate out the green solid that I was expecting, but then I tried to concentrate it down and I used my stove and I had it on very, very low heat. The idea in my mind was that I was going to just put on very, very low heat and I was going to go do something for a couple hours and I'd come back and it'd be relatively dry that I could show you guys. And I was like, you know what, Kurt, this is a really dumb idea. And even on the lowest setting, my stove shattered that thing before I could turn around and be like, you know what, maybe we should just set this outside and let it dry in the sun. Yeah, yeah, that, that was a dumb idea. I could have filtered it. I could have done a whole bunch of different things. We're just going to chalk that one up to oversight. And my stove needed cleaned anyway. Now, first and foremost, 
How thick is that, and I know that some antique person is going to freak out on me, that patina on those casings? Well, if you look it up, generally speaking, it's accepted that copper patina goes to about two thousandths. To put that in perspective, the thickness of your case at the case neck should be about 10 times that thickness. So you are good to go. You're not eliminating very much from that surface at all. Now, if you do this repeatedly over time, then that could be a problem. Remember that a patina is not a degradative process. It's actually a protective process. It is one of the properties that we go for when we're choosing brass. What should you be looking for, though, as a red flag on your casings? Well, if they look anything like they did at the end of our reaction today, that's probably a problem. Now that is going to be indicative of the zinc leaving the alloy. The other side of the equation, greens and blues. And I'm not talking like a little green hue to it, like the next stage after the brown that happens. So, you know, pennies turn brown and then they turn a little bit green to some people's eye. Not that. I'm talking like Statue of Liberty color. That is going to be more indicative of some kind of other compound being present. So, for instance, if you live in an industrial zone, you might have a problem with a acid rain or something like that. That's going to give you some kind of copper sulfate, copper nitrate, uh, sulfuric acid, nitric acid. Uh, generally speaking, that's not going to be a, a problem in the United States, maybe somewhere else on the planet, but generally speaking, we don't really have those problems nearly as bad as we used to, generally speaking, but if you maybe have some kind of mining activity in your area or some kind of leaching out of the, out of the ground, uh, maybe some kind of contaminated well or spring or something like that, that could be leaching some kind of acidic compound onto your range top. If you've got some kind of sulfates or nitrates interacting with your casings, that could be a problem. That's going to show itself in blues and greens. Anyway, that's a long winded way to say that these are fine. And if I take this, oh, that's a terrible noise. You can see that there is perfectly fine brass right underneath of that thing. Just a little bit of polishing in your case tumbler and this thing should be just fine for you. So if you see a bunch of these on the range, correctly identify them as not steel. <laughs> Usually if you see a bunch of casings, even if they're lacquered or, or treated with the polymer compounds for uh, the steel, generally speaking, after they've sat there long enough to look like this, then generally speaking, they're rusty colored anyways. And you'll, you, you'll be able to easily identify them brass versus steel, but these are totally fine. You can use them. And uh, if you see them, don't turn your nose up at them because somebody else has probably done that and they don't, they haven't seen today's video and they don't know any better. Anyway, to keep videos like this coming, please be sure to interact with the video down below. It definitely does help out with the algorithm and it pushes it up in the search results. So if you have somebody who needs to see this video, also make sure that you share it along and do also consider supporting the channel on Patreon. Subscribe star. Thank you very much. And you should see some people on screen right now that are doing that exact thing. Also a really good way to get on that domestic tourist watch list.